Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the middle of his conclusion in part three of his Prolegomena to Any Future Metaphysics, Immanuel Kant is going to linger a bit over a very interesting and for many people compelling example or instance as it's translated, a Beispiel. So this is something that is supposed to illustrate for us a point that he wants to make. And what is this point? So let's check out that paragraph before that, he says that we can never cognize beings of understanding as they are in themselves determinately. We must assume them as regards the sensible world and connect them with it by reason. And we can think this connection by means of such concepts as express their relation to the world of sense. So we can't avoid thinking about these beings, these noumena that, that, you know, are things in themselves that we can't ever fully cognize. We can't avoid that. And yet at the same time, we can't determine them either in the way that would allow us full knowledge or cognition of them. So then the, he says, let's think of the concept of the highest being. And this is indeed delving into the theological idea, one of the uh, ideas in the dialectic of pure reason. So the Huxton's Wesens, right? The highest being, supreme being. And the question that he begins with is, how are we actually going to cognize what traditionally we've called divine attributes? That is things that we can say about, determine in Kant's term, about this highest being. And Kant begins by saying the deistic concept is quite a pure concept of reason, but represents only a thing containing all realities without being able to determine any one of them, because for that purpose, an example must be taken from the world of sense. And he says, then I should have only an object of sense, only not something quite heterogeneous, something quite different, right? Not of the same nature, uh, which can never be an object of sense. So, you know, this is not something that is radically different at this point from other conceptions of how we get to know about God. I mean, there are some very crude notions of God that have been bandied about, you know, where God is an object of sense, but typically we see uh, classical theists saying, ah, you know, you can't really uh, apply these terms. They're, at best, they're analogical to God. Maybe they're even equivocal. And so we're going to come to that in just a bit. Now, deism was, in fact, an intellectual and to some degree practical movement as well that had some adherence, mostly among elites but it represents a certain conception of Deus, of God, right? And Kant is going to oppose it to the theistic conceptions of God, which he says are a bit more robust. Now, he didn't coin these terms. They've been around for a while. He's referencing uh, David Hume's dialogues concerning natural religion in which these terms are used. And Hume is not the originator either. They've been around for quite a while. So how do we cognize divine attributes? Kant is going to lead us through a short demonstration that at least if we're in the Kantian frame of mind, we really can't say much about divine understanding or reason or will. Why not? So he says, suppose I attribute to the supreme being understanding. I have no concept of an understanding other than my own, 
one that must receive its intuitions by the senses and which is occupied in bringing them under rules of the unity of consciousness. So the elements of my concept would always lie in the appearance. I should, however, by the insufficiency of the appearances, be required to go beyond them to the concept of a being. So now we're talking about the supreme being which neither depends on appearances nor is bound up with them as conditions of its determination. Okay, so what we've started with is my understanding and then we kind of like put it on steroids as we say or soup it up or take it to a whole nother level. You know, lots of jargon that's derived from slang there, but I think you get the point. And now we get the divine understanding. And then Kant says, well, wait a second. You don't have any notion of what the hell that is. Why not? Well, he says, um, if I separate understanding from sensibility to obtain a pure understanding, like what God would have, nothing remains but the mere form of thinking without intuition, by which form alone I can cognize nothing determinate and consequently no object. So I would have to think another understanding, such as would intuit its objects, but of which I have not the least concept because the, divine, the human understanding is discursive and can only cognize by means of general concepts. So if I want to attribute understanding to God, very quickly I realize that if I'm going to use the term understanding, I've got to use my understanding, my, my you know, concept of what understanding means for me, and whatever the hell it's going to be in the divine, I'm not going to have any determinate notion of that. What about reason, a higher faculty? Okay, maybe that's a little bit more promising. He says, well, you know, um, that's not going to work either. But what about will? Now, will we understand pretty well? I mean, Descartes, didn't he say, you know, we're like God in that our wills are unrestricted, right? So Kant is going to say, I have this concept only by drawing it from my inner experience, therefore from my dependence for satisfaction on objects whose existence I require. So the concept rests on sensibility. This is wholly incompatible with a pure concept of the Supreme being not going to work. Right? Um, so, you know, this is going to raise some caution for us. And here he brings up Hume and he's going to draw a strong contrast between deism and theism. Now, Kant says that Hume has objections. Now, these are strictly speaking the objections of his characters expressed in that very ingenious dialogue where all three of them are in some respect believers in God, but they demolish each other's arguments and approaches for understanding God. So Hume's objections to deism, Kant is going to say, are actually weak, shock, as opposed to being very strong, sehr stark, right, to theism. Why? Well, Hume's objections affect only the proofs, the Beweis tumor. So deists would give arguments for the existence of God, and Kant is saying, all right, Hume is on point with that, or his characters are at least. But the objections to deism itself are, are weak. Theism, on the other hand, uh, he'll talk about some cases and then in all common cases. And he says that these objections are irrefutable. Un virulegelig. They cannot be resisted. They cannot be contradicted. They cannot be stood against, you might say, right? Now, why is this? Well, in deism, the concept of the supreme being is only transcendent, right? Deism is merely transcendent. And so the determination is, it's, it's some being that's out there beyond our knowledge, but we have to assume that it's there. Why do we have to assume? Well, we'll see in just a moment. And then he says, um, theism depends on a stricter, or we might actually say narrower, neha, determination of the concept of the supreme being. 
And why is this? Okay, so this is where we're going to get to some criticism of Hume for assuming perhaps too much. He says, Hume insists that the mere concept of an original being uh, to which we must apply only ontological predicates. And what are ontological predicates? Things like eternity, omnipresence, omnipotence, right? being everywhere, uh, being all-powerful. And he says, we think nothing determinate, properties which can yield a concept in concreto, that is, in the concrete, must be superadded. So that is mostly an objection to theism. And then he goes on to also add that it's not enough to say that it's a cause. We need to explain the nature of the causality. This is something that Kant is actually going to reject, right? So he says he begins his attack on the essential point itself. That is theism, as he had previously directed his battery only against the proofs of deism, an attack which is not very dangerous in its consequences. All of his dangerous arguments... Hume's dangerous arguments, refer to anthropomorphism. And this is actually a term that Hume has his characters use. What is anthropomorphism? It is when we attribute to God things that we understand from looking at human beings, other human beings, our own experience. So, for example, understanding and will. We understand how those function, more or less, for ourselves. And we say, well, God couldn't be lacking those things. God must have them, but in a super God kind of way, you know. And at this point, Hume would say, this sort of extrapolation, this sort of analogizing is pure anthropomorphism and you don't have any reason to think the divine being is going to be like that. He actually has his characters, you know, back and forth arguing with each other. How do you know the universe wasn't created by a committee of gods or a senile god or some sort of giant spider? You know, once you start going beyond the bounds of experience, things get really, really shaky. And he says that theism is going to be contradictory in itself. If we can abandon anthropomorphism, then theism disappears and nothing remains uh, but deism, from which nothing can come, which is of no value and which cannot serve as any foundation to religion or morals. Now, as a, just a side note, it's quite interesting that during the French Revolution, which is coming up after uh, you know, David Hume's time, um, we are going to see Thomas Paine, a deist, writing a book called uh, the, the Age of Reason, arguing that everybody ought to be a deist precisely because not only can it be proven correct, but it will lead to an improvement of morals, right? So Paine, if Paine's right, Hume is wrong. If Hume's right, Paine is, is wrong. And Kant would actually say, well, they're, they're probably both wrong when it comes down to this. So what do we mean now about this, this anthropomorphizing? So Kant here is going to make a really important distinction between two kinds of anthropomorphism. How do we get there? Well, let's look at the next paragraph. So he tells us, if we connect with the command to avoid all transcendent judgments of pure reason, the command, which apparently conflicts with it, to proceed to concepts that lie beyond the field of its imminent empirical use, we discover both of these can subsist together, but only at the boundary of all permitted use of reason. This boundary belongs to the field of experience as well as to that of the beings of thought. So a pretty important juncture point there, right? And we are thereby taught how these remarkable ideas serve merely for marking the bounds of human reason. On the one hand, they give warning not boundlessly to extend cognition by experience, as if nothing but world remained for us to cognize. And yet, on the other hand, not to transgress the bounds of experience and think of the judgments of the things beyond them as things in themselves. And he says, we stop at this boundary if we limit our judgment Merely, now notice this key idea, merely to the relation which the world may have to a being whose very concept lies beyond all the cognition we can attain within the world. So we've got the world, we, uh, we know the world, we live within the world, we cognize the world. 
We're not satisfied with the world. We move beyond the world, not only to any old noumena or a thing in itself, but to the supreme being. Why do we do that? Well, because there is a relation that we're assuming there between the supreme being and the world. And it is a relation of conditioned to conditions or conditioning. Now, we don't really know that much about the thing, God, that is lying behind all of this. So he tells us we don't attribute to the supreme being any of the properties in themselves by which we represent objects of experience. Thereby, we avoid dogmatic anthropomorphism. This is what Kant is saying theism does. It engages in dogmatic anthropomorphism. Hume agrees. Why? Because it attributes to the supreme being properties in themselves. So the the properties are real properties by which we represent objects, Gegenstände, of experience, Erfahrung, right? So we extend things from the world to God and we say, okay, God has a will, God is eternal, God will pick whatever else you want. This is dogmatic anthropomorphism. Is anthropomorphism always problematic? Not according to Kant, because we can have a symbolic anthropomorphism. He says, if we attribute them, the properties, to his relation to the world and allow ourselves a symbolic anthropomorphism, which in fact concerns language only, nur die Sprache, right? Not the object itself, object, not Gegenstand. So we've got two different kinds of anthropomorphism. One is going to be problematic. The other is actually not only not problematic, it's going to be a clue how we proceed, right? So he goes on and he says, if I say that we're compelled to consider the world as if it were, now that's an important term there, not as it is, as if it were the work of a supreme understanding and will, I really say nothing more than that a watch, a ship, a regiment bears the same relation to the watchmaker, the shipbuilder, and the commanding officer as the world of sense or whatever constitutes the substratum of this complex of appearances does to the unknown, which I do not cognize as it is in itself, but as it is for me, and what does that mean, as it is for me, in relation to the world of which I am a part Now, this is what Kant is going to call analogy understood in its proper, correct sense. So again, drawing a distinction here between what happens in theism, what happens in deism. So he says, such a cognition is one of analogy and it does not signify, as is commonly understood, as most people are uh, making sense of analogy, an imperfect similarity between two things. Now, he's going to use perfect and imperfect, uh, vollkommener, unvollkommener. Uh, this has to do with completion, a term that we've seen you know, throughout this, this entire work, but especially in this third part, uh, reason is seeking its completion in things. So this is an analogy and a similarity that itself is imperfect, not being brought to its fruition, not being fully developed between two things. So when we say, yeah, I've got understanding, God's got understanding, that's an anthropomorphism. And that is, an, that is a wrong kind of analogy. That's the kind of analogy people were drawing in classical theism, and Kant is rejecting that. So what is analogy? He says it is a perfect, vollkommener, similarity, ähnlichkeit, of, now notice, not things, of relations between two entirely dissimilar, unähnlich, things. So it could be two things. It could be two sets of things. Let's look at the example that he just used before. Um, 
if I look at the world and I want to draw an analogy between the supreme being in the world and a watchmaker and a watch, well, that's an example of this kind of analogy. It doesn't really tell us, it doesn't say that God is actually a watchmaker. It says that God is an X that we don't really know what it is, what he is, what she is, what uh, blah, 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 God is, right? Um, but we do know that it bears a similarity, a perfect similarity of relation to the world as the watchmaker does to the watch. So he says, by means of this analogy, we get a concept of the supreme being sufficiently determined for us, though we've left out everything that could determine it absolutely and in itself. So God remains a kind of unknown X, a black box, so to speak, or a gray box, if you like, or a non-box, a void, as Kant has described it. But we can certainly describe the way God is related to the world, the world of our experience. And so he's going to go on. Now let's run through a bit of this. He says, nothing can prevent our predicating of this being a causality through reason with regard to the world, thus uh, passing to theism without being obliged to attribute this being the kind of reason as a property and hearing in it. We're going to reject that. So instead, what we're going to say is that um, reason is not transferred as a property to the first being, but only in its relation to the world of sense. So we can avoid anthropomorphism. Nothing is considered here but the cause of the rational form, which is found everywhere in the world, and reason is attributed to the supreme being, so far as it contains the ground of this rational form in the world, but according to analogy only. That is, so far as this expression shows merely the relation which the supreme cause, unknown to us, has to the world in order to determine everything in it conformably to reason in the highest degree. Now notice what he says next. We are kept from using reason as an attribute in order to think God, but not kept from thinking the world in such a manner as is necessary to have the greatest possible use of reason within it according to principle. What do we do then? We thereby acknowledge that the supreme being is quite inscrutable and even unthinkable in any determinate way as to what it is in itself. So we don't transgress. We don't go further than we should in trying to figure out what God is the way that, according to Kant, theism has done and according to Hume it's done. Deism doesn't have that problem and deism is what we're actually led into. So, you know, he's going to say that the expression suited to our feeble concepts is that we conceive the world as if it came regarding its existence and its inner determination from a supreme reason. By this conception, we cognize the constitution which belongs to the world itself without pretending to determine the nature of this cause in itself. And so he concludes, the difficulties which seem to oppose theism disappear by combining with Hume's principle not to carry the use of reason dogmatically beyond the field of all possible experience. This other principle, which he quite overlooked, not to consider the field of experience as one which bounds itself in the eyes of our reason. So, long story short, Hume is right, according to Kant. Theism is actually incorrect, essentially an abuse of our reason. Deism and symbolic anthropomorphism and analogy, not only just fine, something that we ought to be doing, engaging in as rational beings in order to bring to completeness our own use and ends of that faculty of reason.